Uh, this is the OGM call on Thursday, June 8th, 2023. We got no choice because we're mixed into humans. Is that it? I can say no more. Okay. Uh, any more on the uh, robots would come find you to recruit you to their side, maybe. <laughs> Funny, Eric. Yep. Greetings, all. Greetings. Hello, Janet. Hello, Stacy. Hello, Jerry, Doug, Eric, Doug, and Gil. Um, I have a, uh, oh, Mike Nelson as well. Um, I have a friend um, uh, from Portland, uh, Janet Unruh, as uh, joining us uh, to say hi. Yeah. Um, hi. So all about. Hi, Janet. How's up, Portland? Yeah, hi. Yeah, Portland's okay today. It's gorgeous. Yeah, it feels pretty good. Yeah. yeah. Better Portland than New York, huh? Man. Uh, yeah. The East Coast We've is getting a taste. Share, though. Yeah, the East Coast is getting a taste of what we had two summers ago. Two yep. summers, yeah. yeah. Two summers ago. Mm -hmm. that was nasty. Philadelphia is worst. Really? Do you guys ever yellow? Like I've never seen such yellow. Like we're, we were yellow. Mm -hmm. I, yeah. I'm so shocked. Yellow, so orange, it's all kinds of fun. So yeah. you, know when, you know in the uh, Edvard Munch, the famous painting, The Scream? Yep. You know how the sky is kind of orange and all yep. that? Yep. Mark, you're doing a very good representation of it. <laughs> um, do you know why the sky is orange? Krakatoa. Bing. Because it's all the blue's been scattered out by the smaller atoms. No, no, no. It's not why is the sky blue. Uh, Krakatoa had erupted beforehand. And for like a year and a half, two years, skies all around the world were kind of orangey. Uh, yeah, but that's because the blue was missing. Yeah. Oh, OK. Well, it, whatever was happening uh, for interference of ash cloud, et cetera, of course. Well, well, we had the geogra geologic answer, and he had the yeah. physics answer. Exactly. The year without the summer. It's a climate answer. Oh, no, that was that was uh, 1814. That was Chamboa. That was an even bigger volcano. Hmm. You need to, need to be careful when talking to a geologist and challenging him on these things. <laughs> and what, so what it's worked on climate is western war. Java. <laughs> Sorry, there was two of you talking at the same time. Uh, Mike, then Ken? Yeah, I was saying I also worked with Al Gore and climate. So we had all the people talking about, you know, what could cause global warming and what might cause global cooling. There is that. Go ahead, Ken. And I said, for what it's worth, Krakatoa is west of Java, not east of Java. <laughs> Thanks to a movie, everybody thinks it's in the wrong place. Oh, I, I you know, thank God I hadn't had that misconception <laughs> placed in my head. Um, Cool. Eric, there you go. There you go. The version um, of Java before before um, uh, Jakarta sank. Jakarta's wow. still sinking. And relocating. Really? Has everyone discovered the airnow.gov website? It's, it's the seventh mm -hmm. most popular website today. Yeah, mm. you used it a lot when we were on fire here a couple of years ago. Really yeah. extraordinary, particularly the maps. You can see the whole region. Yep, yep. So do does anybody think that this is going to have any effect on people's perception about climate change? Sure. People meaning the mass. So I got a yes and a no. Well, the problem is the people who are most opposed aren't living on the East Coast. Hmm. Well, you know, in the in the 30s, uh, the Dust Bowl reaching Washington, D.C. was some of what drove the policy change around agriculture and soil conservation in the United States. It was like congressmen having to walk out into clouds of dust. It wasn't just in Nebraska. Same thing with uh, London smog, basically. Yes. The, air smog became, the air became unbreathable and catalyzed a bunch of uh, yeah. Yeah. regs. Did uh, anybody see the map in uh, of what's on fire in Canada? It's quite extraordinary. If you haven't seen it, I'll see if I can pull it up. Three different places. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Nova Scotia is not known for forest fires. Yeah. So is there, is, is there a debate over whether this is uh, climate driven or are there other factors at work here? Uh, Stacey, what's your question? Right. My, my, well, it's sort of like a statement question. I haven't heard anything about efforts like as far as putting out the fires, like usually like in California, I would hear constant updates about what's happening, you know, how they're getting ahead of it. I haven't heard one word. 
No, there's been a lot of on the East Coast. There's been a lot about it. Uh, I'm on the East Coast. American forest fire fighters uh, coming into Nova Scotia, but some of the parts further west are just so remote, and there's not much to be done. Yeah, hey, Judy. Hi, Judy. There's Great. a map of the fires in Canada. Ooh, Red wow. is out of control. Yellow yeah. is being held, and blue is under control. That is that, insane. I would, I would imagine that Nova Scotia doesn't have quite the firefighting infrastructure that California does. But I don't yeah, know. luckily they got a lot of rain, so you can uh -huh. see from that map that it's more or less out. Well, mm -hmm. the reason I ask is that, um, so I'm in New York, and the conversation is very much about the color of the sky and the air quality and staying safe. But mm -hmm. if you're not focused on the fire and putting it out, then you're not focused on the cause of the fire. Mm -hmm. So I, I think it's a mistake. I, I mean, I think there's some sort of a disconnect in the coverage. And I have this morning, I put on like every every news that I put on BBC, I put on Fox. Fox actually had the best coverage for this sort of thing. Fox local or Fox national? It was national. Good for them. I mean, when I say the best, I mean, you know, keep in mind, they're trying to stay away from so many other stories and, you know, it didn't stay the best for long, but at least they were talking about it. Yeah. Well, that's good. I'm glad your standards have been lowered sufficiently where they could perform above them. <laughs> um, I love that. And, and Stacey, uh, wildfires are really controversial. Forest management is controversial. Um, all these things are crazy making. I was just looking at an article this morning, uh, an op-ed in the New York Times that basically says there are just too many, I'm paraphrasing badly, there are too many idiots who are starting forest fires. And it turns out that usually it's uh, lightning strikes and stuff like that. But in the US, 80% of our forest fires are man-made, human-caused. Because we have more uh, idiots per capita? Uh, the, uh, the, the, the big... Uh, what was it called? I'm forgetting the name of the fire in, uh, out west was caused by a guy and his son who went shooting in a dry forest. Uh, and uh, so, yeah. Uh, and then and then what you do with forests to keep them from becoming tinderboxes, never mind climate change, is a controversial issue already. Uh, and then once you factor in the drying of climates and all that kind of stuff, I, I'm marveling that in the spring, in the early spring, Alberta, Canada was on fire. Mm -hmm. uh, we were getting some some wisps of smoke here on the Pacific Northwest because the the uh, Alberta was really suffering. Mm -hmm. And now it's that now it's sort of Quebec and uh, and Nova Scotia and parts east. And I'm why is why are the fires so high on the continent? Is part of my question. It's like what crazy thing happened that Canada is ablaze. Well, you know, everything, heat, heat is moving north, wine districts are moving north, fire districts are moving north. That's part of it. Is it because hot air rises and north is up? It was just a very dry, dry, <laughs> dry, dry <laughs> spring. I'm, I'm just trying to say they didn't the... rake their forest floors. Yeah, that's it. That's it. They had twigs well, and, and part, trees. Part of the controversy is about fire suppression as a driver of massive fire. Exactly. So, so Stacey, when you try to put out every fire, what you get is massive confl conflagrations you can't put out apparently and this is i am totally an amateur here but but too much fire suppression actually is a problem and then i was reading two days ago about silvo forestry which is like uh what we, what we do with cattle is we clear a bunch of ground and we graze them on grass the, a really healthy thing to do is actually to mix trees in and all, all other kinds of plants and then cattle and goats and whoever else basically eat down all the shrubbery so they're not as liable to catch fire and the cattle really like the shade and a whole bunch of other good things happen. There's carbon capture from the trees. Like the, the blend of cattle and, and trees is, is lovely. Yeah, silviculture yeah. and agroforestry and polyculture in general, good thing, you know, thumbs up for that. Um, uh, grazing cattle in forests is not going to work for, high, for very remote forests because you can't move the cattle. What really happened is that um, Smokey the Bear woke up out of hibernation and looked at the world situation and saw things were so bad, he just went back to sleep. And that's why we're having all these fires. Glad to have that clarified. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. You're welcome. <laughs> I think we're underestimating the disruptions that are already on, uh, in the, underway because of the shrinkage of the Antarctic ice. So the Gulf Stream has already slowed down. The jet stream is disturbed. Um, which means that weather patterns are floating, right? Because you don't have the trade winds that kept everything uh, in a nice place before. So the the 
um, this is coming on much faster than than we would have ever expected because you know I keep saying we don't get we can't process for this exponential change. You know whatever you looked at today is going to be doubled tomorrow. You know? By far the most interesting hearing I helped Al Gore organize when he was a senator was called Climate Surprises. Mm -hmm. uh, we did over 30 hearings in four years, but this was the one that really, really brought it home. And it was all the nonlinear effects. Is that a link, Mike? Wally Broker, who's famous for discovering the conveyor belt system of ocean currents, the that it drives the Gulf Stream, but it also drives flows all around the world. Yeah. And that's really what's changing right now. But he walked through all these things that could happen if yeah. you if you see more melting of the uh, Greenland ice sheet, that changes the salinity of the North Atlantic, that changes the conveyor belt. And then there were surprises with the spread of malaria, tropical de yep. diseases. Yep. I mean, there's all these little third order things yep. like, you know, the, the drier temperatures in the Southwest have meant that the trees are yeah. under stress. So these Japanese beetles that showed up have easy pickings because the trees can't defend themselves because they're under so much stress and then you end up with dead trees that of course light up in a in a forest fire yeah. we had My, a long I, list of these the big surprise though was that the bush administration tried to censor the testimony of james hansen who was you know one of the top 10 climate researchers on the planet and, and OMB, the Office of Management and Budget, actually tried to rewrite some sentences in his testimony. And, and, it, and it wasn't like they added a paragraph saying, uh, other scientists say this. They actually put it in first person. So oh. you know, he was having to say, I, I must stress that, that everything I've said might be wrong. I mean, it was crazy. And Al Gore just had a field day and we had five cameras live. It was really quite an event. Yeah. Mike, I was one of Al Gore's volunteers in the early 2000s, going around doing, uh, you know, his climate science presentation um, in various places. Yeah. Yeah, he's still doing that. He's he's trained hundreds of thousands of people to do that. And he's worked a lot with the churches, mm -hmm. weaving it into, you know, saving God's creation. Yep. Mm -hmm. But I was so surprised, Mike, when I when I, I joined Al Gore's climate reality training camp for the month or six weeks back or so, and and got I'm certified now for <laughs> climate reality. <laughs> but but he didn't say one word about nature based solutions. Completely, I know. Completely you, you mentioned that based. on the earlier call. Yeah, I I, I was surprised. Yeah, I was just, yeah, but it's not another project for you, Klaus. Yeah, no, no, it's 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 underway. We actually have a meeting this afternoon, and and I'm meeting with the leadership uh, 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 next couple of weeks from now. Uh, they're planning a big event in September, so they're really crashing into the farm bill. So that's good to see. But it was just an astounding blind spot. Well, but it, some of it is that the science is a little more controversial. I mean, Woody Harrelson did did not really help things. Does Woody Harrelson ever really help things? <laughs> well, he made a few good movies. <laughs> uh, but his documentary, I mean, it, it, as far as raising consciousness and, you know, getting farmers to understand that how they treat their fields might have impact on the global environment, that, that, was, that was helpful. But there were lots of claims and things in there that, you know, are hard to, hard to ver verify. And Mike, you were just describing how, just one sec, please. Yeah. Um, Mike, you were just describing um, how Al Gore tried to sort of go um, the religious route and say, hey, uh, guarding God's creation. I was present uh, for a Gore talk when the first sentence out of his mouth practically was, I don't understand how business doesn't understand or how I can't convince business that going green is the biggest business opportunity since electrification. I don't get it. And Stacy's asking us in the chat, um, the average unconscious person isn't maybe connecting climate change and these fires and other sorts of things. How the hell do we make connections and wake people up to to create a difference to go to go do something? I mean, really, it's the, the, there's there's something that's sort of um, cultish and tribal about the defense mechanisms that are preventing the conversation, and 
and we need to slide past those things or melt through them or something like that, uh, because th those are very good defense mechanisms. They're very powerful somehow. Well, one of Al Gore's, you know, favorite lines was, you know, denial is just not a river in Egypt. Yeah. <laughs> and he, he was quoting dire straits as well. Right. Exactly. Um, Go ahead, Mike, and let's let's move back toward like a slightly guided conversation because right now we're in major popcorn mode and we're not even doing check-ins. So let's uh, right. see see how far this goes and then maybe start a check-in round. Yeah, Gil, Gil does make the point that Gore spent a year in divinity school after Vietnam. He actually he is actually perfectly trained. He, he did some journalism. He did divinity. He did government at Harvard. I mean, he was one of the most broadly educated war, cor war right. correspondent. Well, exactly. War correspondent in Vietnam. Yeah. Um, just to, um, I was just going to add one more thing, which is Nelson's first law of politics. When there's a political fight between a small group of people that know exactly what they have to lose and the general public that has an uncertain, diffuse understanding of their of what might happen for them, the small and dedicated people usually win. And that's why the oil industry has rolled over the rest of us. I may, uh, this may be a corollary to that or a neighbor uh, lemma or something like that. But in a fight, uh, the, the party with the least to lose often wins because they are willing to sacrifice themselves wholly. Now, that's not true of the oil companies or whatever else here, but it is true of a lot of other fights. Um, and so you have to worry that, that somebody who shows up who doesn't care what happens uh, as an outcome, but is but is in for the fight that they're very dangerous. Mm -hmm. You put both of those theories together and you get the US court system today. Well, fabulous. Sounds like a great set of design principles for a court system. Ah. Uh, does anybody know the history of legal systems? Because I've always been a little confused between Napoleonic law and British sort of the British non-constitutional government and U.S. law and other sorts of things, and the fact that we have a, system, a contentious system of, of law, uh, adversarial law, instead of any kind of uh, beneficial law. I'm, 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 I would love for somebody so, to do that well. So the short, the, short, the short answer is British law was mostly common law, which just kind of arose. Um, and, you know, a lot of the decisions uh, made were um, kept in books and records. And then French law slash Napoleonic law is much more statutory, you know, with a list of codes and laws that needs to be followed. Um, it's, it's all my and, the, the, Right. And um, the litigiousness is something that really grew here in the U.S. Um, and especially um, kind of jet fueled and rocket fueled when um, um, advertising became legal, uh, um, fueled by a guy by the name of Stephen Brill. And also when um, he also was instrumental in, um, as opposed to law being a, a learned profession of some kind, turned it into a commoditized business um, by measuring profits per partner. And then you had big law grew up and then it just became factory law, um, all about, all about money and all the advertisement. And then we've exported the litigiousness to other parts of the world. Did I put the right Brill in the chat, Stuart? Um, I think it is. I think he's the famous Stephen Brill, but don't know. I, I'm, and yeah, yeah. He's he's he started off as a journalist, um, and you compare that to you know um, um, indigenous uh, tribal law, which um, I I looked into a lot when I was studying um, conflict resolution. It's just so incredibly different. It's much more personal. It's much more communal. Um, it's much more geared to getting the real stories out on the table as opposed to who can tell the better story. Um, so, I mean, that's just a, a little brief overview. Mm -hmm. Cool. There's one, there's one other piece to uh, the law domain. 
um, the difference between law and equity. The religious institutions, Judaism, Catholicism, um, controlled the law that governed the body, actions over the person, hmm. what they could and couldn't do. Um, whereas the sovereign controlled the rules of commerce and regulations and statutes and such. So that split is sort of an interesting, an interesting difference. Yeah. Uh, thanks, Doug. Um, Eric, do you mind telling us a little bit about Bastiat? If you know something to share, but you mentioned him in the chat. Unless you are away from AFK. Um, all right. So we have run our first 20 minutes rather quickly. Uh, and this is uh, our first check in in four or five weeks. Judy is delightful to see you. Um, thanks for joining us. And uh, we'll, we'll let's go run some check in for a while. And during check in, here's our evolved check in S protocol which is uh, I will step back and not be running the floor at all. Uh, if you would like to, if you feel moved to check in, raise your Zoom hand to step into the queue. Uh, the Zoom hand looks the same for everybody in gallery view, so you can tell who's next. So you should be able to tell when you're next. Perfect. And uh, then uh, before stepping in, take a pause, if you will. So uh, one, of, one of the comments we've uh, paid attention to over time is our conversations run fast and furious, and it would be really nice to have some pauses, and the pauses really help our conversation. So uh, the sign that you know what's going on is you've unmuted yourself. Like you raise your hand, you go into the queue. Uh, not many of us are muted right now, but when you unmute yourself, we're like, oh, good. You know that you're next, but you're, you're quiet for a while and then step in and check in. Uh, and then please check in only once during the check-in round. And when, we're, when everybody's had a chance to check in, then we'll go into general discussion in the mad frenzy that we were just having. No, 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 in a much more thoughtful way. Um, so we have a queue started. I will step back and uh, off we go. I'll step in since it's quiet. <laughs> um, apologies for being so absent. It was mostly good personal stuff. My daughter got married May 21st. And so that was a lovely experience, but fairly time consuming in preparation, uh, more so on her part than mine. As usual, I'm still reflecting on what it is I should be doing and thinking about now in terms of making the best contribution to the world in good ways. and. It seems as though what's happening in the short term is really an organizational development role in all of the nonprofits with which I interface because they tend to not pay full attention to the dynamics of being the board of a nonprofit in terms of how we choose to, to select and hear information, how we respond and consider and so forth. So that's kind of what I've been up to for the most part and trying to catch up on the reading because I have just stacks of books. <laughs> I'm also contemplating at some point, though I love Minnesota dearly, last year's winter was a killer with a 20 inch snowfall. So I'm contemplating moving south. My daughter's in Houston now at Baylor as a faculty member. And I have a condo in Kansas City where she did her postdoc. And so it could be a transitional move to Kansas City. And then at some point connecting to Houston as well. So that's kind of, Round Robin. Thank you, Judith. I, I, I never know how many seconds one should take for uh, contemplation, but. Uh, it's a loose and individualized protocol. Feel free to second as many seconds as you'd like. Okay, my cycle time is such that, you know, 10 seconds seems like a very long time. But uh, I've got um, a couple things going on. Um, one is just intimations of mortality. Uh, I think many of you were on the call when I mentioned that my college roommate 
uh, passed away last month and um, six months older than I am, died of brain cancer. Uh, one of my favorite priests from our church, who was two years older, just died. And um, I was hit pretty hard when I saw that George Winston had died. Um, he's 10 years older, but he's been fighting cancer for 10 years. So he got cancer about my age. Um, and on top of that, I'm fighting some of those old people problems like high blood pressure. And now I, I seem to have macular degeneration, which might be getting worse. I mean, this is not the bad kind that makes you blind, but it's sort of the warning kind that could turn to the bad kind. And um, it, it just, it just, it's the pits for somebody who is very active and just likes to think of himself as eternal and uh, unstoppable. Um, so that's the sort of the mindset that that is uh, that I've been dealing with. On the more happy note, um, I'm also to the point where I'm starting to think about how does one structure a, a semi-retirement and how does one enjoy life? Kathleen and I both love to travel and She's worked so hard for so many years that we think that, in, you know, by the time I'm 65, we're certainly going to be enjoying a lot more of life. Uh, but even that's a little hard. You know, how do you how do you structure that? How do you decide what's the most important thing to do? And how do you find purpose when you're not going to the office every day? And these are these are all really interesting questions. And I I, I see a lot of silly talk about having a fulfilling retirement. I don't, I don't see any definitive book or website that, that really has caught my attention. So um, any, any thoughts on, on how one does this? Um, my parents are still alive. So that's, you know, something else that is sort of a, a purpose in my life, making sure they're doing okay. Um, but I've had to be the executor for two uncles in the last two years. And as of two days ago, I wrapped up the second one. Piece of advice, never volunteer or be coerced into being an executor for anybody. <laughs> At least unless they're you're a son or daughter. Thank you. So good segue, thank you, um, Mike. So I think I shared in this group um, some weeks ago that I had a diagnosis of multiple myeloma and it really is a life-changing event. Um, you know, in some sense, it's a little bit of um, whose body is this? Um, looking at, at, at mortality, um, thanks, Gil and Doug, for both volunteering to have conversations. Um, I will take you up on that. Um, but it, it's, uh, it's caused a reflection about um, most everything. And it's, uh, you know, uh, I, I realized that I went through that cycle of grief, uh, you know, <laughs> uh, denial, bargaining, anger, uh and then and then you know you kind of come out the other side um with the realization that um um for me the big one was that um so many people um use their disability as an identity i'm going to repeat that because it's worth saying use their disability as an identity um we we see so much of that in the culture um, and I, you know, the realization that, wait a minute, you know, um, my identity, um, uh, my life is a lot bigger than whatever disease process I happen to be in, um, and coming out the other side of that. So, um, engagements, um, include, um, Completion of a of a a twelve week twelve week program with Meg Wheatley um, about who we choose to be identity at this point in time in the world. Um, I've been asked to go on the board of Barkana, which is Meg's nonprofit, um, which I'm very very pleased about. 
Um, I started a year-long program about um, mindfulness and social, social action led by um, a woman named Rhonda McGee, who's a mindfulness teacher and law professor at the University of San Francisco of many years. You know, that just um, began. It's being run by the um, Bari Buddhist Center in um, Western Massachusetts. And I've got a, a new book percolating, um, a third edition of the book, Getting to Resolution, which will combine some of my recent writing poetry and, uh, you know, an update of 20 years um, uh, uh, world situation that we're in. So that ought to be a kind of a, um, a fun project. So that's my check-in. It's a pleasure to be with you all today. And also, I mean, the, the, a, a big thing um, is um, a whole new appreciation for life and a lot of gratitude just for breathing, just for breathing and the miraculous earth that we um, live on. I say that with a, a deep and profound level of reverence. And I, I wish that more people would, would, would wake up to that very, very, very simple fact that we are, um, we're killing the golden goose. Thank you. Stuart, of course, I wish you the best of luck and the best of health. Um, as a lymphoma survivor, um, two years now, um, certainly I've participated in many groups where other people um, who have leukemia, I know a 13-year-old um, boy and a cousin who has leukemia right now, um, uh, two separate people. Um, uh, You can you can beat this. I wish you the best of luck. Um, to continue a theme, unfortunately, um, I had a biopsy, um, kind of going in through my nose to a maximal maxillary sinus. Um, took out a growth about uh, the size of two raisins. Apparently, the sinus is filled with a growth, could be cancerous. Yet another happy, you know, um, <laughs> wonderful, <laughs> wonderful, joyful, happy, happy, joy, joy um life um bump um mortality moment as i call it and uh, certainly um i feel um uh that i've healed from kind of stress um uh difficulties but you know more more difficulties um uh reading is fundamental and fun um but uh you know, I'm not participating in the organization and um, coordination to basically, you know, organize protest, um, uh, you know, kind of taking some time off from work. So um, my toe in the water is, are, are these calls um, and, you know, talking to people who are you know, connected to groups that are doing things. Um, um, and of course, good friends and just um, trying to um, have compassion. Uh, certainly my problems aren't the biggest problems in the world. And, uh, you know, I did have a number of folks um, pass away, which kind of triggered my um, uh, difficulties uh, earlier this year. and. Um, yeah, um, we just know that more folks are going to pass away as we get older. And um, um, good luck to everybody and compassion to everybody. My check in. Well, I'll start with continuing the theme. Um, as, as some of you know, my wife got diagnosed with multiple myeloma nine and a half years ago. 
And uh, being the geeks that we both are, we were all over the internet researching and the research said, yeah, you got two or three years to go. And her oncologist very quickly said, please stop looking at that stuff because it's all obsolete. You're seeing, you know, re reports published several years after research that started like five or 10 or 15 years before. Uh, we're in a completely different story. We asked him how long he said, I don't make projections, but I've got people with me 10 and 20 years. And she's now nine and a half years in and we're in a partial remission. Um, um, so that's pretty cool. Um, and the, the science is advancing very, very rapidly on this stuff. It's quite remarkable. Um, but what I really want to say about that is that at the beginning, she said, uh, please don't tell people that I'm battling cancer. Because it's not a battle, it's a dance from her perspective. Uh, and she said, please don't um, invite people to say, oh, Jane, I'm so sorry. That's terrible. I'm so sorry to hear that. That just wasn't the mood that she wanted to be in about this. Um, there's, a, you know, there's a legacy mood in the culture of like cancer is a death sentence uh, and it's terrible. And you know, it's, it's far from easy pathway. And Stuart, you're going to learn a lot about that. Um, we've had some very rugged times in these nine years, but the mood that she's chosen to dance in uh, has been really important to her and to me. And um, one of the things we decided early on, um, what was the term we used for? Um, hang on, I'm gonna ask. From Michael and Sean, uh, until Gil comes back, we're doing a, the S protocol, which is raise your hand to step in the queue, uh, take a pause before you step in. You'll you'll catch the rest of it from here. We're just doing a check-in round. Sorry, Gil, go ahead. No, no sorry, sorry to step out. So what what what, what we established as our, as our mantra early on was no premature freak out. You know, there'll be plenty of time to worry about things later. Let's not just dive into worst case and get all upset until we know more. So it was like a gradual pay attention, listen and learn and adapt. Uh, so blessings, Stuart, to you and Mark, to you and to everybody else who's dealing with disruptions. Um, um, we, we have found that mood matters a lot. Um, to my own check-in, um, uh, I, I guess what I'll, what I'll say is that um, I spent three hours on it was Tuesday or Wednesday with the exponential organizations people, EXO, uh, in a webinar of uh, Peter Diamandis from the, um, um, what's the, what's the, uh, the X Prize. Uh, right. and, and, and Salim Ismail from EXO, they've just released a second edition of their book, Exponential Organizations. By the way, it's 99 cents this week on, uh, on Kindle. And um, I can send people a recording of the webinar if you like. It was it was quite remarkable and very engrossing. And I rarely spend that kind of time on anything. Um, distilling lean startup and lots of learning from lots of organizations about how to aim at 10x rather than 10% kinds of improvements. Uh, with remarkable stories in lots of industries and um, uh, in, inspiring in a lot of ways, including for me personally, the, the critical path capital enterprise, the, uh, the private equity fund for good that I've been trying to build has been on hold for a couple of months. Uh, and this has brought me back into that thinking about how to do it in a very different way, in a very untraditional, not typical private equity way that can scale and have impact more rapidly. The, the mantra always in the back of my head is, um, is Mondragon in America. Uh, and for people who don't, Mondragon, don't know Mondragon, it's a, what, 70-year-old Spanish cooperative of cooperative, 70,000 employees, I think, hundreds of enterprises, banks, universities, manufacturing facilities, something remarkable that has not happened here. Um, so I'm, I'm entering into an exploration about that. Notable, though, and Klaus, this is for you as well as other people, for all the brilliance that was there, it seemed that there was an enormous blindness to biology and ecology. It's mechanistic medicine, mechanistic agriculture, lots of excitement about vertical farming, which has its merits, 
but you know, I, I was one of the pioneers of rooftop ag in the United States 50 years ago, and I stepped away from it because I felt a deep, like personal as well as strategic dissatisfaction with growing food without soil. Uh, and so I didn't go into that world. They're in it, and there's something something strongly missing in the vision, and yet some very powerful tools there for us to use. So I'm going to be exploring that world some. Um, and last thing, very briefly, uh, I've uh, I've opened up a beachhead on Substack, which uh, Doug C has pioneered for us. And I'm thinking a lot about how to streamline my white writing workflow to be more sane for myself and more valuable in the world of what, you know, how to, how to do multi-platform publishing and the like. So uh, I know other people here are interested in that. I'd love to talk with anybody who's been exploring that path. And I am complete for now. So I am thinking of dying as an adventurer. Uh, I'm 86. Uh, I don't feel it most of the time. I notice that most of my friends are dead, which is really hard to take. Uh, I'm somewhat amused by the problems with sexuality. Uh, but generally, slowing things down or whatever that is, means everything is seen in a new perspective. And uh, since I've got this project of dealing with climate change and, and trying to be pretty active with it, uh, it seems to uh, keep me alive and going and not uh, feeling terrible about it. Uh, the project is really important. Uh, writing is just terrific because you find out what you think. And I think that's really important. Uh, I was kind of hoping today, totally different, that we might talk about Apple's new Vision Pro, which is just an amazing piece of equipment that's going to have... Uh, huge and devastating effects. That's it for me. Um. I'd like to take us sort of back into OGM-ish territory a little bit. Um, this has been a really lovely community check-in call, which I really appreciate. And we have a lot of things going on with us in our lives. Um, and I'm just going to sort of head back a little bit toward OGM. And I want to put a sentence in the chat, which I will read out, which is a funny sentence, uh, but means a lot to me. And I would just love later, perhaps, uh, if uh, anybody wants to talk about it. But it goes as follows. Um, cyborgs practice up keto to garden the big fungus for a better verse designed from trust while developing the precepts and rituals of fubarism. And I will very briefly explain, these are all a series of ideas that have shown up over the last 20 years. Uh, I, some of you know that right now I'm working on like, what does it mean to be a good cyborg and that we're having, we have a cyborg future ahead of us. Uh, that us blending well with software is probably one of the paths toward fixing stuff and changing how jobs work and how we all relate to each other and so forth. I'm not clear it means donning headsets that block us from one another's presence, but that's a whole conversation for the check-in. Um, up keto is a, a coining, it's a blend of upward spiral and Aikido. Aikido is my sport. Upward Spiral was inspired by Paul Crafell, uh, who has been on a couple of these calls magically because of interesting things. But he, he, he did a short video uh, 20, 30 years ago about how he and his trowel were fixing mending hillsides in central California just by walking around and paying attention to how water works. So up keto is a practice, at least in principle. Uh, what, would, what would it look like if everything you touched were improved by your presence? That is what up keto is meant to be. And then the big fungus is metaphorically the shared memory that I wish we were building. Uh, and I'm using big fungus here because mycelium are, is such a beautiful analogy for knowledge work and rhizomes and all that kind of interconnectivity stuff. And also because um, 
uh, farmer ants, uh, leaf cutter ants can't eat leaves. They actually take the leaves into the hive, hand them off to a subset of those ants, which mulch them up and have a symbiotic relationship with a fungus. And that fungus metabolizes leaf matter and feeds the hive. So happy fungus, happy hive. And I have felt like a lonely fungus, a lonely ant at the fungus phase for 25 years that I've been feeding my funny little brain file. And so I wish that there were many of us inoculating and feeding uh, a common fungus that would then nourish humanity so that we could solve the problems that we're facing. Uh, I would use all these superpowers to design a better verse, which is my cranky uh, comeback to Zuckerberg deciding to rename Meta as the Metaverse, yeah, me uh, Facebook as Meta, you know, homage of the Metaverse, an initiative he appears to have abandoned, uh, but which drained billions of dollars uh, out of Facebook. And uh, for me, like the better verse is this space within which we build trust again and we start to solve the world's problems. And in order to build trust, we have to design things from trust. So I'm, I'm putting in this long statement, the notion that if we actually began to understand the hidden architectures of mistrust that litter our environment and keep us from one another and keep us from fixing stuff, and then flip things around to design from trust, we might actually get someplace. And um, all of this uh, would lead to a community of practice that would be developing and designing the precepts and rituals of Fubarism. And some of you have heard me say, talk about Fubarism, which is a domain. I bought Fubarism.com years ago as a joke. Fubar is a placeholder file name for programmers. It goes back to F-U-B-A-R, fucked up beyond all recognition, which probably comes out of World War I. You know, somebody would show up and say, Sergeant, well, what's the situation on the ground here? And he says, sir, we're Fubar. Um, which is related to SNAFU, also a military acronym similar. Um, and Fubarism is just an open question of, hey, if you could develop your own religion, what would you put in it? Because one of my beliefs is that we need to resacralize our relationship to ourselves, to one another, and to the planet. And I don't mean organized religion by that. I just mean that we need to treat one another and the thing that we live on that keeps us alive as sacred. And if we did so, we would change our behavior radically. We would change so many things if we changed how we see and treat uh, one another and this big rock. Um, so that's the funny sentence. And if uh, if anyone's interested when we finish our check-in round, I'd be thrilled to know or send me something out of band uh, privately or on the list or anywhere you'd like. But I'm I'm... I'm interested in if, if this is just way too distracting or if this is an interesting stringing together of, of topics and issues. With that, I am complete. Um, well, not to step on Jerry's attempt to pivot, but I'm, uh, <laughs> I'm going to rest <laughs> the conversation back to uh, where it's been. Um, on uh, mortality and um, and legacy, and I, I'm <clears throat> I've talked about this in some other conversations, and I can't remember if I've talked much about it here. But um, I've been uh, focused quite a lot on not just my own mortality, and and I was you know I. I don't know what I missed before this, but I, I tuned in for, for Mike's check-in and uh, you know felt very akin um, in that I'm at that age where you know people around me are starting to die. Um, I'm like taking care of one remaining aging parent, um, uh, dealing with um, some my my wife's grandfather uh, just died. And uh, I remember some of you may remember me like doing uh, um, OGMs from a big truck driving stuff of his back from North Carolina. Um, and it's had me thinking a lot about um, proactively engaging both for myself and with other people in the shaping of one's legacy and, and what you leave behind, um, particularly with regard to um, stuff and the knowledge around stuff. Um, 
and there's there's you know like holding on physically and mentally to um, what you have and trying to keep it the way it is until you know your lights blink off um, is a way of thinking about life and you know, dealing with the, the, the lack of quite being able to do that. Um, but I'm thinking a lot and talking to people a lot about the idea of really viewing the later parts of life as a transition to something that um, your knowledge, your stuff, your, um, you know, what you have to offer lives beyond and that quite early on in life, you know, decades before your eyes closed for the last time, you're living into that reality um, and, and really just tr trying to work to shape what you're leaving behind, what you're letting go of um, and, and making it an adventure as, as you know, um, Doug said, and, and, a, and a more joyous thing that, you know, my God, what, what, what gift you have to offer in not just the mentoring that you can do to people based on what you know, where you're actually, you know, meeting them and talking to them, but, you know, kernels of knowledge, areas of knowledge around things that you know about, possessions that you have, um, collections that you've made, and making it possible for other people to find things that maybe you don't even know the significance of that you, they can weave into larger frameworks like your brain, Jerry. Um, and um, I, I'm, I had a long talk actually last time I was in the Bay Area with um, Wendy Hanamura at the um, Internet Archive, and and you know we were connecting about this, um, and you know, and I think with the Internet Archive is something that could be a big part of that, um, but I'm I'm really interested in building something and very interested in talking to people who are are looking at that transition wanting to engage with it in a positive way um, you know I also think about legacy businesses Gil I know you've thought about this and we've talked a little bit about the this you know people living into the fact that they are going to leave their businesses behind, they don't have an heir, um, and, you know, how you, um, how you make something that, that lives beyond you, that is a beautiful thing, and, and what, what your, you know, digital legacy is. Um, so anyway, lots of stuff there, eager to talk more about it with anybody who would like to. Thanks. Just a small interjection. It's interesting that um, the value of this demographic that we are brings up this conversation today. Just a brief observation. <laughs> Yeah, I often uh, lament our lack of diversity, but this is one case where it's kind of a thing of beauty. <laughs> Judy, oh, Judy is on the call. I think she's here. If you're talking to us, Judy, you're muted. If you're talking to somebody else, never mind. No, I, I was talking to you. I was just thinking that while we're reflecting on it specifically as an end of life issue, this is much bigger than that. It's really an all of life issue. 
And somehow if we could shift our energy toward enabling others to perceive the all in life issue of meaning in life and contribution and things like that, it would be a powerful movement, it could be a powerful movement. So, um, hello. I have a friend I speak with, um, I've known since 1970. We met in junior high school and we uh, we get together every Wednesday usually and talk for a couple hours. Um, and his daughter just graduated from college. She went to Paris uh, and she spent her college years or during the pandemic. And basically she didn't really meet anybody. She stayed in her room. Um, she didn't really see Paris. She's also the girl who said that she'd never seen the Milky Way. And I was talking last night, my friend runs a, um, he's a senior uh, bioscientist and, you know, he runs a lab and he's like all the, all the people in the lab who are doing the actual work, the pipetting and everything, you know, they're, they're in their twenties and there's this really vast gulf between us. You know, they're attached to their phones 24 seven. They relate through phones. They don't really talk. They don't interact. Everything is done on their devices. And that got me thinking about um, how how many younger people, especially, um, relate to each other through devices rather than face to face interactions. And there was an article in the New York Times recently about um, the dissolution of communities, where um, the the author actually blamed devices. Said, you know, it used to be you showed up for people, but now that everybody has a phone, you can just text them and say, "Oh, I'm sorry, something else has come up," and you feel like you're absolved enough to be there. And I really think there's a there's a profound impact of the digital realm on human behavior and human interaction, especially for younger people. There's there's so much seduction, you know. It's uh, how many millions, how many billions of dollars and millions of person hours have gone into figuring out what's the best way to keep people, you know, in need of being on their phone all the time. Um, and the world is burning down around us literally canada is on fire the war the northern forests of this continent are on fire and uh, there's a connection there for me i don't know how to quite make it but it's like we're not paying attention to the world around us because we're absorbed in this digital realm and i think there's a really um profound need for reconnection between generations along with reconnection to the earth we have to resacralize our connection to the earth to each other as you just said um and to figure out what is the best use of digital technology in creating a world that works for everybody where children do get to grow up and, and see the Milky Way? And where if you're attending school in a, in a city that's not your own, you actually do have the opportunity to go out and the pandemic was a special case, but you know, it, it kills me that this girl spent four years in Paris and didn't really meet anybody or, or get to see the city. I'm just, it, it, it really makes my heart heavy to think about this, that it's happening with so many. Um, so there's a profound, uh, for me, sense of loss and sadness around the way people are no longer um, attending to the world around them, and they're just sucked into devices, and you know it, they're sucked into the metaverse or the, the worst verse or whatever verse it is. Um, but it certainly isn't the the world that I grew up with, um, and it may be that our time has passed. You know that that we're turning into uh, into a cyborg, you know, I just read, um, James Lovelock's Novacine, the, the rise of hyperintelligence. And he's talking about the emergence of cyborgs and how they will probably take over from us. Um, and I, I find it very provocative and his book was actually written, but it's really a scary scenario. Um, and so not one that I easily embrace. So just thought I'd throw that out. And if anybody wants the Novacine, I have a copy, I can email it to you, just ping me and I'll be glad to give it to you. It's a short book and it's Really interesting read. So there's that's that's all the stuff that's just been brought up for me in this conversation. I, I really feel like we should um, be taking some time to sense into how do we want to relate to each other and how can we relate to our, our younger people, especially those of us who are older now. Um, I realize I, I'm kind of aging out. My cohort is mostly folks over 50, and I could I need to spend more time getting to know younger people. Um, 
and hopefully making some kind of difference there. So thank you for listening. Yeah, you know, that really makes me think that we we are just amazingly privileged to live in what has to be the most uh, incredible time for humanity. You know, I mean, when you, I was born in 1949, um, thinking what happened you know, along the way in terms of I mean, there were 2.4 billion people on the planet when I was born, you know, then it was 3 billion in 1960 and 6 billion in 2000. Now we're at 8 billion. We want to get to, we're actually already at 8.1 or so. We want to get to 8.6 by 2030, the technology raising, you know, but <clears throat> I think um, while I was working, and I think that's probably true for, most of us, in, in order to make a living, right, and accumulate enough money to have a comfortable retirement and all of that stuff, you really didn't have a lot of time to focus on uh, you know, the bigger picture issues there. You had to be really focused on your skill set and your environment and all of that. And I retired in uh, just about 10 years ago, and I've done nothing but study since. You know, and and the privilege of being able to take courses at Columbia and MIT and Duke and John Hopkins, right? To just go on Coursera or edX and, and take the most incredible uh, uh, courses really at, at very qualified uh, institutions. I, I mean, it just it just opens up like a, another dimension, right? I mean, we, 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 there is a spiritual dimension that we can uh, float into. And, and and you have the collective wisdom of our species at your fingertips, right? I mean, you can read Plato or you can, you know, read the Bible and interpretations of the Bible or Tolstoy and so on. So the, the, the accumulated wisdom of our species is, is for you to, to, to tap into. You know? And so those things are just absolutely incredible but then you're also faced with your own mortality right i mean there's an end point here somewhere and you know my son is 33 so we have these conversations saying you know i'm on the down on i'm on the down side of, of life you know and uh, um and actually this goes faster you know so so you you go up and it changing from 10 to 15 to 20 years of age are massive changes but then when you go from 30 to 40 to 50, there's not much going on. I mean, you feel pretty, you know, the same. But then once you hit 70, from 70 to 80, I mean, that's significant, you know. And uh, and then from 80 to 90, that's, uh, you know, that, that is a whole different trip here. So you have to be prepared for that. And 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 at this stage, you know, how do you, how do you prepare for aging gracefully, right? Um, but I think there is a unique challenge to our generation, right? Because we are, I mean, at least those of us who who have the the the, the privilege of uh, of time and 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 resources, so you can connect uh, with technology, you can connect, you know, with uh, other people in conversations like this and 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 elsewhere. And there is this question of. Uh, responsibility right i mean what's your what's your take on how you make how you leave a world behind for the next generation and you know, when i was working in asia i became very aware with my uh, chinese friends the perspective of life right seven generations backwards seven generations forward and that's just i mean that's just how they were thinking right i mean it's a dishonor to dishonor your ancestors, right? Because if you do something that they build and you demolish it, then that's dishonor. Then conversely, your your honor is are your children, right? To uh, to move forward and and help them to succeed and uh, to be in good places. So there is this 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 very strong sense of honor you know, that used to be pretty profound in Western culture as well. But I think it sort of has 
moved on, right? I mean, I don't see that very often. Um, and so that's, 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 you know, uh, that's unfortunate. But that, none of these things were in my awareness uh, until I retired. And then after I retired, and then it took some years to pull all that together, right? To where, what are you leaving behind? You know, what's, uh, it's, a, it's a relay race you now. So who are you handing this over? Um, yeah, and, and, uh, and then you become aware of life itself, right? Because, you know, this is, we, we are embedded in a much bigger form of life that uh, we have just not even take notice of. And I was thinking the other day, you know, in the Bible, it says we are the stewards, right? We're stewarding the land. Well, let's do it. Stewarding doesn't mean destroying it, right? I mean, if you, if you have been given a gift that is this fantastic planet, this fantastic, amazing a beautiful life uh, all, the, all around you and you become responsible for it simply because of the influence you have on it right then that's demands stewardship and right now we are really becoming very aware of this need to be stewards because if not we're going to die <laughs> that's it, simply spoken so yeah so sorry rambling check in here So I, um, I had sort of two tickles in previous shares in the invocation of uh, our need to sacralize things. And the reason it gave me a tickle is because that's the problem. Like that's, that's how we got where we are in a strange sort of way. Um, being in reality with all senses and faculties present and accounted for um, experientially ends up um, providing an enabling awareness of interconnection of, of us to everything around us and us to each other. And um, our, this, you know, this thing on our shoulders that we were in, endowed with without a manual, without a governor um, has really been amazingly creative and inventive at abstracting us from being. And I think, um, and, and I've also learned something. So I'm going to invoke the indigenous meme, but with a qualification so it avoids all these things about, you know, the indigenous weren't all good. Um, indigenous consciousness as manifested in the world today it's difference from our consciousness in developed and Western cultures is um, they never lost connection to themselves internally in terms of the physical body, the emotional body, the energetic body, the mental body, and the spiritual body, all operating, all connected and flowing in relation to each other and their connection to the biome around them and to their environment and to the world they're living in. Western culture and Western civilization has really been amazingly effective at alienating our human beingness from our existence. 
So I would posit that it's not about sacralizing the earth, which is creating yet, making the earth yet another golden idol. Sacralizing is rooted in the word sacred and the word sacred is connected with God or dedicated to a religious purpose. Um, religions are constructions that separated us, Western religions, Abrahamic traditions, especially separated us from nature and the natural world. And Klaus, you referenced um, stewardship and stewardship was the fundamental tenant at the heart of, of Western religions that declared the natural world wild and untamed needing to be subjugated to our will. When they alluded to stewardship, it was always in the context of imposing our will and order on the natural world. So um, just as a counterpoint, maybe it's simpler and more fundamental and basic about getting reconnected and in touch with our own faculties, capacities, natures, and our connection to each other and our connection to that world. Because if I'm connected to you or I'm connected to my planet, I'm not gonna burn it. I'm not gonna drill holes in it. I'm not gonna destroy it. I'm not gonna kill you. I'm not gonna be in adversity to you or anything or anybody else. And with that, I'm complete. Uh, not everybody has checked in yet. So if you'd like to, please raise your Zoom hand and step in. Um, otherwise, I'll wait a little while and then we'll go into general discussion. There's no mandate to check in, so you can pass if you like. So what would anybody like to talk about that came up? It's, we seem to have dwelt a lot on our mortality and our relationships to one another and to stuff and to the planet. Uh, we started with what the hell is going to convince people to care about climate change and all those sorts of things. Uh, we went all over the place. Um, what would we like to focus on? I, I like the suggestion of spending at least another three minutes on Apple's big announcement and the re world's reaction to it. And perhaps looking 10 years hence. So we have we have uh, 15 minutes left in our call time. Shall we spend it on Apple's Vision Pro announcement? And okay. sort of what version five might lead us to. I, I'm, People I'm actually... first in electronic LSD and. Right. Uh, Gil? Um, it, it's intriguing, Mike, but it's a very different mood than what Jerry just offered. And I'm wondering how to connect those. So can we look at the Apple Vision Pro in the context of what Jerry just riffed about what we've been talking about? Or um, is there a way that Vision Pro can serve the, you know, the, the thoughts that have been arising in the last 45 minutes? Um, but I'm I'm I, I I'm, I'm, I'm happy I'm, to go I'm, Jerry's direction I'm because we'll be talking to... about Vision Pro for weeks to come, and there'll be more <laughs> intelligent analysis. I think uh, we talked a I, bunch I, I about. I don't want to lose the mood of the last forty-five minutes. Thank you. Uh, we've also it's also been moderately intense going through, and um, we talked a bunch about Vision Pro uh, Monday on the Free Jerry's Brain call. That was like mostly our topic. Uh, because I think it was then because it was so fresh, you know, sort of hot off the presses right then. Um, anyway, uh, Doug, you raised the topic, uh, and I think you could manage, uh, you could finesse the uh, the topic in the way that uh, we're wondering about. So please go ahead. Well, I'm thinking that uh, Vision Pro actually implies the death of the self. Mm -hmm. So I think the two issues are quite connected. In Vision Pro, you never know quite what's what. 
uh, whether you're in an environment that you control or is being controlled. And it trivializes the presence of the person. That's my experience. Anyone have one or touched one? No. Uh, they, so uh, it was only demoed in a specially uh, built tent uh, near the Apple campus to people invited in for a half hour at a time. No pictures, no video. The, the thing is not finished yet. It won't be shipping until the spring of next year or early next year. Uh, so there, there's none in the there are none in the wild, none available for purchase. Um, one wag uh, pointed out that uh, Tim Cook or nobody else actually wore one during the presentation. That reminds me of a joke. Oh, good, perfect. So, so Bill Gates dies a little unexpectedly. He gets to heaven, and Saint Peter goes, "Oh, Bill, I wasn't expecting you. Let me look at your file. Ah, uh, Bill, you know." Um, you're a tough case because you did a lot of good stuff, but you also gave us Windows 95, you know? And so tell you what I'm going to do. I'm going to give you a tour up here and then we'll I'll give you a tour of hell and you can choose where you want to go. So he shows around heaven and it's all very silvery and quiet and cloudy and people playing harps and very sedate, you know? And, and he says, okay, let's see hell. And he takes him in the elevator down to hell and, and there's this party going on. There's music and dancing and feasting and, of course, there's fornication and, you know, all the stuff you'd expect in hell. And, and Bill says, well, if it's all the same to you, I'll, I'll stay here. So Peter says, St. Peter says, fine. You know, a few months later, St. Peter's got a slow day. He says, I think I'll go visit my friend Bill in hell. And he gets off the elevator and there's Bill Gates chained to a pillar of fire with a harpy eating his liver out over and over. And he goes, St. Peter, this is terrible. This isn't at all what you showed me. What happened? And St. Peter says, Bill, Bill, it was a demo. Sorry, it's just I, I remember the joke. I, I, I am fond of that joke. That was the demo. So that's kind of the Vision Pro. It's a demo right now. It's all. It's not. It's vaporware. It's. It's. I it's can't believe they look. announced a product that's not available for a year. You know, like come on. Uh, Klaus then Mark. Yeah. Um, this, this. I see this as part of the entire AI discussion. You know, because we are we are constructing a vision of reality that may not be what is reality, and and so the more the more these these things diverge, um, the less able uh, we are to continue building you know, a functioning, sustainable uh, into the future society. And I think that's where uh, the, the, the intentions of building this kind of technology are not clear. Right? Is it for entertainment um, or is it for really seriously engaging on a deeper level with the world around us? And because, I mean, for example, there were some games coming online even 10, 20 years ago where you could build a, a, a city, right? You could, you could plan the city and see how it functions. And the software was smart enough to tell you that if you forgot to put in a water purification plant, your city wouldn't function well, right? So there was, you could play what if games and so on and so on. So this could be you know, a much more sophisticated, more advanced version that helps you construct you know, an understanding of the world around you to make better decisions and to have a far more sophisticated understanding of how to, where to engage. I just don't see that happening. You know, that's that's sort of the, the concern. So it's not the tool, it's how it's being used and how it's being uh, uh, developed. Um, apropos nothing is real, really quick before Mark goes, uh, the thing has 12 cameras plus LIDAR. There are like, it, it's insane how many cameras are on the headset. And it gives the appearance that you're just looking around, seeing your room as you look around. And it gives people standing next to you the appearance that they're looking at you because strangely, this, this like really odd, it has a display on the outside that then has a simulation of your eyes, including I think if you blink or gesture or whatever else, it is recreating what you look like from a scan of your face taken when you basically log in and, and make the device yours. You have to personalize the device at first because this device solves an ins 
insane number of very difficult biomechanical technological puzzles about where your eyes are on your head, how you see out, how do I, and, and all these cameras are recording everything and then projecting them into two little 4K displays that show up right in, one in front of each eye and mirror the world. And it has to do so with such precision that you won't get nauseous. And latency and, and sort of uh, refraction errors and stuff like that cause nausea and all sorts of bad problems. So they've done miracle magic work to solve insanely difficult things to separate and recreate reality in a way that really troubles me uh, in a way that, that you were just saying, Klaus. Um, because you're looking around and it's busy recreating your whole environment. You are, these are not transparent in any way goggles that you couldn't see. If they're off, you can't see through them. There's no way to see through them. Um, but it looks like somebody's seeing your eyes through them and you think you're seeing the room around you. It's all recreated. It's all on screens. It's all mediated. It's, it's cray cray. And that's just one little angle on it. Sorry, Mark, go ahead. Had to, had to throw it in. I, 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 on the call we had talking about it, I, I was wondering how many cameras and Pete, of course, did the, the quick lookup and he says like 12 cameras. And I was like, does that count the LIDAR? And he's like, nope. So 13. Mm. Over to you. I, uh, I mentioned uh, David Gelertner's uh, 1993 book, Mirror Worlds, in this context, um, and to sort of bridge uh, <laughs> bridge the meaning and uh, and uh, VR AR um, uh, threads, because um, basically what what he did in in Mirror Worlds was talk about how well imagine the metadata of reality. Uh, being uh, laid plain and uh, and visible, and indeed, I think he does, in fact, talk about about that in an AR uh, kind of context. And so maybe that's what's maybe that's one of the big wins of of AR in particular is uh, imagine being able to you know drill into um, uh, drill down into the things around us informationally, or uh, or see the context of the things around us. Uh, and then, yeah, be able to collaborate about those things, and uh, um, yeah, have have an impact on a, a new, fresh ways to have impact uh, and understand uh, what's going on in the world around us um, through uh, through AR. Over. Thanks, Sean. Uh, Mark then Gill. Um, Sean and I collided. Yes. Um, so yeah, I was thinking about mirror worlds as well. Oh wow! Uh, posted in the. Uh, um uh, uh yeah, chat right a, there uh, review of it from 1991 so it's a 19 it's it's a 91 book um uh not 93 but anyway the um the difference between fantasy and reality um mm. i've read a um uh, ink.com um uh, emotional intelligence series um, and the three words back to reality um, was really interesting um, in terms of you know um, for for me psychological health um, basically you know thinking you know what's um, what's important to pay attention to and sacred for me means that of which is most important and sanity that's pretty up there in terms of most important <laughs> I remember um, reading post high school um, William Gibson's book. Um, uh, oh gosh, what was his first book again? Um, uh, uh, Neuromancer. Neuromancer, yes. And one of the uh, um, Rastas um, in uh, you know, near space L five, uh, you know, moving people around. He took a look into the um, cyberverse. Um, cyberspace and he took off the goggles and uh, he was asked you know what did you see he goes babylon you know when we create fantasies to escape reality and that includes a lot of news unfortunately um these days uh boy um can we lose track of of the sacred and uh just to let gil go 
I'll, I'll stop there. Um, thanks, Mark. Uh, Ken, I'm wondering if you need a second for a poem, should you have possibly brought one with? Got, got some queued up. You'll go ahead. We are okay, on the off chance that Ken has a poem. I just, <laughs> uh, yeah, let me try to be brief. So um, um, uh, fantasy versus reality, I both have their place. Fantasy is really important to humans. The blurring of them, the confusion between them is where it gets iffy. Um, back on the Vision Pro and everything else we've been talking about, I, I think about this, I, I keep going to biology and ecology. And at a very fundamental level, I'm concerned about having bright lights being pointed directly into my eyes and the effect on endocrine system of that. And I don't think anybody knows what that's going to do. You know, I mean, we all, all know about, you know, being on your phone late at night affecting your sleep. There's a whole biological hormonal system going on there. So there's that. Um, but more to the point, um, golly. A lot of this is about being rooted in the living world. And if I'm experiencing everything through these double 4K screens in my eyes, what happens to sense of touch and smell? What happened? I, I'm Jerry, go back to, was it you talked about your friend's daughter who was in Paris and never got out and never saw the Milky Way. That was Ken. Way. Yeah, never saw the Milky Way. Now look, you know, Vision Pro can do great shit with the Milky Way. One of the transformative experiences of my life was seeing Powers of 10 film when I was like 22, 23 years old, you know, what, or, or you've seen it as cosmic zoom, maybe, and like flying through universe at vast scales, which Vision Pro could probably do remarkable things with. Um, and Klaus, to your world, it could take me into soil life in a way that nothing else could. Uh, on the other hand, it can leave me completely ungrounded in the living world. And Ken and I have talked about this a bit. I, I wonder about how people can be grounded when more than half of us live in cities and never touch the ground, never have bare feet on the ground, never lie down on the earth. And so Vision Pro takes us to a very different kind of world than the world of physical body and physical world. And I have, you know, facet, like with everything else going on, deep fascination and deep concern about that. Last thing on that, we talked about AI early on and somebody I saw came, came across a quote from someone who said, no, AIs aren't gonna take your job humans using AIs are gonna take your job, which says to us, I think, how are we gonna dance with these new technologies to, to serve, um, where is it here? Back in my notes, Jerry's, Jerry's, you know, Jerry's mission statement there about uh, better verses and foobars and all that stuff. Yeah, right? yeah, it's so easy to remember too. Yeah. How does this stuff serve that stuff? Thanks, Gil. Thanks to everybody. So uh, returning once again to the amazingly fantastic poet Vistava Zimborska. This is a poem called I'm Working on the World. I'm working on the world, revised, improved edition, featuring fun for fools, blues for brooders, combs for bald pates, tricks for old dogs. Here's one chapter the speech of animals and plants. Each species comes, of course, with its own dictionary. Even a simple, hi there, when traded with a fish, makes both you and the fish feel quite extraordinary. The long suspected meanings of rustlings, chirps, and growls, soliloquies of forests, the epic hoots of owls, those crafty hedgehogs drafting aphorisms after dark, while we blindly believe that they're sleeping in the park. Time, chapter two, retains its sacred right to meddle in each earthly affair. Still, time's unbounded power that makes a mountain crumble, moves seas, rotates a star, won't be enough to tear lovers apart. They are too naked, too embraced, too much like timid sparrows. Old age is in my book. It's the price that felons pay. Don't whine that it's steep. You'll stay young if you're good. Suffering, chapter three, doesn't insult the body. Death, it comes in your sleep, exactly as it should. When it comes, you'll be there dreaming that you don't need to breathe. That breathless silence is the music of the dark. And it's part of the rhythm to vanish like a spark. 
only a death like that. A rose could prick you harder, I suppose. You'd feel more terror at the sound of petals falling to the ground. Only a world like that, to die just that much, and to live just so. All the rest is box fugue, box fugue laid for the time being on a saw. Hmm. Nice to see you folks. Bam. Till next Thank week. You. Thank you, Ken. Fitting finish. Mm. Thank you. Bye bye. Um, briefly before we hang up, um, I mentioned in the email invite yesterday about this call that we might do five minute universities. And I was thinking of doing those next week, but also I had mentioned, I think last week that Mark had brought up the question of indigenous wisdom, which would make a great topic for a call. So I'm torn between the two. And if you want to pipe in on either of them, maybe on the Mattermost channel for the OGM Town Square would be a good place for that. Uh, but I'd like to sort of uh, make a choice and so we can do a little. And if we're gonna do five minute universities, I'd love to know who's gonna volunteer to do them, et cetera, et cetera. All right. Gil, go ahead. Gary, is there um, is there a five minute university website? There is no such thing yet. Uh, should, there, there should be. Do you own the domain yet? There could be, and I don't think I bought one for that. Strange. Please go buy it right now. Okay. I, I'll, I'll probably have to buy some variant of it. I'm sure there's something out there of that nature. Mark, go ahead. Could you introduce five minute universities for? Yes. So, uh, so, for so, so, so many years ago, I thought, gosh, and this is. I think before TED existed at one of the re at one of the retreats, I was like, gosh, there'd be a cool format. There's a lot. You realize that there's a whole bunch of knowledge that most of us hold that we don't get a chance to share out very much. And there's stuff that we sort of are passionate about. And it might be how to brew a really, really good tea. And what is the history of tea or why? What's the difference between green tea and matcha and what? Or it could be a, a DSRP, which Scott Mooring was telling me about, which is a, a way to a way to look at uh, to do systems analysis of the world, and that's one of the the five minute universities I'm thinking about. So the format is we give somebody exactly five minutes. We put up a timer so that it's not going to go long. It's, they've got to compress whatever it is they want to share with us for five minutes, and then we do five minutes of Q and A afterward. Uh, and I've done a couple of them. Unfortunately, the ones I put on, on YouTube, like the first one, which is one of my favorite books, The Great Transformation, it's an eight minute university, alas. Um, but uh, if we can compress to five minutes, that'd be, that'd be really useful. Uh, that's the format. But, but it's kind of something you're passionate about, really wanna share, it's a nugget of wisdom. And we know that it's not gonna take an hour. It's not even gonna be like an 18 minute TED talk. It's just gonna be five minutes. And then we'll get five minutes of Q and A. And if you're deeply interested, you know to talk to that person again afterward. Gary, the uh, domain Mike, muted. Sorry? slides are allowed or encouraged or not? Uh, slides, if you wanna, because we're here in Zoom and slide sharing is easy, and it might communicate more stuff. So yes, um, there's Gil? also Pecha, the Pecha Kucha format, yeah. which is yeah. that's even more rigorous. Exactly. Um, I, I don't see the domain being taken. Uh, Father, Father Guido Sarducci pioneered the concept. Back yes. in the day, Forbes had an article about it. There's an Apple podcast, uh, but the domain seems to be free. There's a so five spelled out spelled out five minute university.com. I'm going faster. I'm not as fast as Pete. Oh, okay. I'm doing the best I can. <laughs> cool. I will I will go find one and, and put it up. Awesome. Thanks, everybody. Really appreciate it.